we doing, Nation JS? Good. Let's give it up for my friend Jen. Fun fact about her is she's from New York and North Carolina, so our favorite foods are barbecue and pizza. So uh, come see her if you want to go out for barbecue and pizza. Well, if you're like me, you like to level up, whether that's fitness, talking to your cat, or in your career. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, leveling up in your career and how I went about that and my, what my experience were doing that. Who am I? Well, I'm Alicia Wiggins, or Anderson. I just got married, so I'm having a hard time getting my name right. <laughs> well, yeah, I got married, yeah. <laughs> Alicia Anderson, I work at Geocent. They're in the, off, uh, the lobby here. Um, get some socks, a tumbler, whatever you want. They didn't tell me to do this, but it's a great company to work for. I like working there. Everyone's really cool. We have some cool projects, and I love to have you join me. And on Twitter, I'm Alishba underscore Lang. So I'm going to tell a little story about my career. So I started on a business. I wanted to go in and be this really powered uh, marketing professional. I'll travel the world. I did a minor in Spanish, and I thought I'd live in Spain or something. And that didn't work out. It was 2008. I was lucky to get uh, the job I did get. It was nothing glamorous. I was pushing paper for the government, and uh, I hated my life. So I decided to go get a master's at Georgetown, focused on technology management, and I loved it. The master's gave me a very large overview of what was in the technology environment so that I can start my career and move forward. So I went in to be a technical support uh, analyst, and I learned SQL there, and I thought, hey, I really like creating these reports, so I want to do more of that kind of creating and things like that. So enter my position as a production support analyst for a company. So there I tail logs, I did production database updates, I responded to users where anything went wrong in production. And in this position, I was given the opportunity to do some development. So I did the whole nine. I was doing tickets. I got to go into uh, sprint reviews and all things of this nature. And I got to submit tickets, which was really cool, into the application. This is what I wanted to do. And I felt I wanted to do that more than uh, the production support analyst role. But I wasn't quite there to be a developer at this point. So I got my kind of first job job. I was kind of there, not exactly there, but I had that opportunity to get the little bit of experience that I could and move forward from there. So in order to level up, I decided that I need to make my own little schedule here. I don't want to be in this kind of hybrid uh, role right now. I want to know how can I get from where I am in this kind of hybrid role to being a full-fledged software engineer. So I did side projects, which later turned into projects for my portfolio. I did meetups, met people in the community like Robbie and a lot of people out here, Sean, all these people I learned and met people and networked. I did coding challenges on Hacker Rank and Code Wars. I did uh, books, like eloquent JavaScript, things of that nature. And I watched vlogs mainly to get motivation. There were many people on YouTube saying they got a job in two months, they got a job in three months, and I thought, if they can do it, I can do it. So I went about this uh, way for a couple of months. My schedule during this time, I did this for a length of five months. I did uh, four hours on the weekdays right after work, and I watched those vlogs for the motivation. I looked at uh, presentations during this time as well. I went to meetups to continue to be a part of the community and learn things. On the weekends, I did more of that. I did eight hours a day of coding, anything I could get my hands on to practice. And then I went to uh, vlogs for motivation. So at the end of all of this, I got my first dev job, and that's at Geosynth. So now I'm in my job, I'm in this position. Okay, so day one, wh where do I go from here? I have the job, I worked hard the last few months, you know, what's gonna take me to that next level? So this is kind of a uh, common way of going about things. Our company doesn't actually follow this 
trajectory. No one really, not many companies go junior, mid-level, senior, lead, principal. A lot do, but ours kind of follows this. But I wanted to see, get something that everyone will understand. So I'm here at a junior position, and I wanted to know, you know, what are the best ways to go to a mid-level? I'm kind of in this little medium area here. I don't know how to get from where I am to where I want to go. So I know the current ways to level up. I know the current ways to level up. What's going on? OK. So <laughs> you can work on the side project, which I did. You can uh, contribute to open source, which I did. I, you can watch conference videos, which I did. You go to meetups, just like I was doing before. But all these things were what I did to get the job. OK, everyone's doing this. People who are trying to get their job right now are doing this. What is something that can set me apart from all these people that are doing the exact same thing to level up and to get the job? So in my job, I've been there for about seven months or so, and I was looking around for things to do that would help me learn more about the code and grow as a developer. So I thought about, what about code reviews? Uh, in my first position as a kind of dev job, I got a lot of feedback in my code reviews. In this job, I get feedback in code reviews. I learned a lot about the app and how it works. And I thought about, hey, is there something that could I, I could use to level up? So if you're in the audience and you don't know what a code review is, I'm just going to go through that quickly. It's when you tag a fellow developer on your team and they review for syntax, readability, adherence to the language, and things of that nature. Now, the steps I'm talking about are you write some code for your ticket or story, you submit a pull request to GitHub, you have a back and forth dialogue with someone on your team, and once it's agreed upon, uh, consistent on how this code should be, then it's approved and it's merged and master your local branch is merged into your production system or your QA uh, software system. So the steps I'm not talking about, I showed this presentation to my husband, and he said, you know, some companies don't do code reviews. And this was unbeknownst to me. I'm coming from a background where I'm you know, open source, pushing PRs to these projects. I had no idea there were areas where you don't do code reviews. And if you do do code reviews, there are some areas where you, everyone comes into a big meeting and you go over that person's code review. That's not what I'm talking about in this presentation. I'm talking about this collaborative environment where there's a back and forth and you can ask questions and uh, grow from that experience. So that's what I wanted to clear up if anyone's in the audience you don't do code reviews at your company. So, what can you learn from code reviews? What did I learn? So I learned how to debate. We do a lot of debating on our team, and I'll show that in some of the uh, examples I'm going to show. Uh, how to persuade, how to persuade someone to your way of thinking, uh, how in-depth knowledge of the language, and you learn how to present yourself to the team. These are all skills you're going to need as you're moving forward in your career, moving to a lead developer, or things of that nature. You're going to learn how to be a leader. You're going to need to know how to persuade someone to your way of thinking. You're going to need to know how to argue your thought. You need to know these different skills. How's you moving forward from being a new person on your team or someone who's um, just started with the language to someone who's more experienced. So in the co first code review, I learned a lot about formatting. Uh, you know, here the class is way over on the side. Uh, it's not aligned properly. Uh, this would distract me from finding actual bugs in your code. Um, this should be avoided. There's a lot of different uh, software out there like ESLint, Prettier, things of that nature that will help you with this before you submit your code up to code review. And it just helps the code review focus on other things of the code, like the readability and syntax that will go off production and cause bugs for your team. So this is an example of presenting yourself well to your team, showing you take your code seriously, and saving each other time by focusing on other areas of the code that they can review and make sure it's a good fit for what's going on in production or your QA environment. Second code review, 
I learned about built-in JavaScript methods. So I had some code that looks like this. And of course, this isn't any production code. Uh, it's just a fun little thing. I have an array here. I initialize to a variable, and then I have a string. I loop through that string, and I push that into that array. And then I return the array. And I had a code review, and someone said, oh, hey, you know, there's this built-in JavaScript method where you can do that in one line. So basically, I saved myself some lines here writing this code this way, and it made it more readable, it made it more maintainable, and it made it so that anyone reading my code knows exactly what this method does, distracting from the uh, title of the method that says toArray. So uh, they know exactly what's going on, and they can pick it up from there. Third code review, binding. Where should you bind? Now, this was a point of contention on our team for many weeks. It still is uh, where to bind. Uh, so in our code, we have ES5 in one of our applications that we work on, I should say. Uh, we have ES5 classes, and we have ES6 classes. And we're upgrading from ES5 to ES6. Now, ES5, we all know, or you might not know, it auto binds. So not much of a consideration. I'm sure there's other areas that you would uh, bind there. I'm not sure. I'm not too experienced in React to know. But um, in ES6, you have to actually uh, say where to bind. So there's three different ways that we research. There's binding in extractor, arrow functions, or binding in render. So in this particular uh, code review, I used the arrow function. And I only used it because it was like that in previous areas of the code. And I got asked about it. And I was like, I don't know. That's why I copied from other areas of the code. I don't know why I did it. So I researched this. And I found about these three ways. And so this started this whole discussion about how we should bind in this component and where to go from here. So after days of this argument, I found this uh, flowchart. It's written by Cory House, the plural site. It's not mine. And I thought it would help us get to an agreement about where to bind in this particular method and component. So I use the flowchart. We are using ES6 classes. We weren't willing to use stage two features at the time. And we, weren't, we were having some performance issues. Uh, the app was going kind of slow. So we went with binding instructor, which was fine at the time. And we said, oh, it's also great because new team members will know where to bind. This is going to cause less performance issues. And now when we have a new application that we're building, we're using arrow functions. Well, we went back to that because arrow functions and binding and render, they say it's perceived performance uh, improvements. But in reality, it's not that big. And also, arrow functions look a lot better than having a whole bunch of custom methods defined in the constructor. So we went back to arrow functions. It's working out pretty well. Time will tell if we should move our binding somewhere else. But uh, finally, this argument is kind of the bed for the most part. But we still have, uh, every so often, we'll talk about <laughs> where she will bind and what's the best place to bind. So the fourth code review, I learned about setting state. And it's asynchronous. So I had a, a method like this. I grabbed the state of peep count, and I was updating that state each time uh, this, this method or this button was clicked. And I thought it was a great button. I tested it a few times in the UI, and it worked out pretty well for me. But when I got to code review, one of the senior uh, developers told me, hey, set state is asynchronous, meaning that is going to sometimes batch those requests up for perceived performance improvements. And I might not see what I expect to see in the UI, or users might not see, because it's okay to introduce a bug. And so I read about this. And what you can use here, and what I did use, is a callback function. I use that to make sure it's going to wait until that update is actually set, and then uh, perform that update. So I can make sure what I'm getting and what I'm expecting is true. There's also a lifestyle method you can use, component did update. But in this particular situation, a callback function worked just fine. It's something we're using in the code as well in other areas. 
So fifth code review, prop types were new to me. I had no idea what these things were. Um, I didn't know how they function and how they can be used for me. But I did research it because that is something encouraged on our team to research something if you don't know, of course. So I researched it and I uh, had a method like this. I was grabbing props, um, min and max, and then from these props, I do a calculation. Now, you can see from this method, if I pass in something like a string or an object or an array, it doesn't mess this up this whole method. Uh, it won't give to the user exactly what they were expecting. It's going to throw all kinds of errors. So I wanted a way, or the reviewer said, you need to have a way to uh, make sure that what's passed in is going to be uh, numbers. So that's what prop types are. You can specify what type of prop should be coming in and say if it's required or not. If it's not required, you would supply some default types. So if it's coming in as a string or an array, it will go to that default type. So the important thing to remember about this is prop types, the warnings won't display in production uh, to the user. You'll see it in the console, so it helps with debugging, but it's not going to display right to the user. Also, it is going to complement testing. So if you have a test that's running it, it's going to complain that the prop type isn't defined, and then you're going to have to debug that and make sure your tests pass. But in most part, it's really great to be able to sign a type. It's not really uh, big in JavaScript that I know of to type and stuff, unless you're type scripting. But uh, it's a great thing to use so you can say what type needs to come in to your component to make sure your methods are working. So some things to consider. Don't take it personally. I, deal, I have a hard time dealing with this today. I take hours, not so much now, but before. I, used, I took hours to figure out an issue, a problem, and I wrote something I thought would work, and then I get to the code review, and they rip my code to pieces. Like, I'd get tons of comments. They tell me, your code looks horrible. No one ever says that to me, but I mean, but yeah. But they'll say something to the, along those lines, and uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to me, because I spent so much time on making sure this problem worked. I thought it was so clever, but it wasn't. And it, it was hard for me. But it's all about growing and learning. And if you go into it with that attitude, it's more beneficial for you. You're becoming a better developer. That was the way I was able to level up. I was able to get to a point where I could take any ticket, and it's fine. And I could uh, work on anything, and I can um, have a positive contribution to my team. So don't take it personally. It's all to make you better. Going with the open mind. So I talked about how on my team we argued a lot about binding, and we still do. Like this is an ongoing argument. And um, if I went to another team, I wouldn't bring my thoughts from that, or I would, but I would listen to what they're doing and go in with an open mind about how they're doing things and what is their uh, viewpoint on it. So. If you're a senior or someone who's been around for a long time, go in with an open mind. Hey, here's something I can learn from this experience. Uh, just go in trying to figure out something, or maybe you learned something new yourself you didn't know, you thought you knew, but you didn't really. So use it as a learning opportunity, again, to grow yourself. And then be prepared to explain what you wrote. Uh, a lot of times uh, you write something and you're not really sure what it does or how it works. Uh, once it gets a code review and someone asks you about it, that's when you, you can do it there or you want to do it before, preferably. But knowing exactly what you wrote and why you wrote it and how it works will go a long way when explaining and persuading and arguing with others on how to, if you're going to use that in production or if you're going to change it to whatever way they suggest it. So, I talked about, you know, some companies don't use uh, peer reviews or code reviews. So if you're in this situation and you're here today and you're saying, hey, you know, this code review thing seems like a great way for me to get it better. Uh, well, you, there's some uh, avenues for you to do this. You could do this the way I did it. I did it in an open source. I um, was submitting uh, 
pull requests or code reviews to different organizations. There's organizations like Jenkins or Spree. There's Ruby for Good. You can talk to Sean about Ruby for Good if you like to. But there's tons of open source projects out there where you can get the experience getting code reviews, peer reviews. They have contribution guidelines. And um, just make sure you're following those. And then you get your code <laughs> reviewed and see how you can level up. There's, you can do a study group. You can get to people, get her with people here you meet or online. There's tons of DC um, meetups and uh, Slack channels. You can get with a couple of people. You guys start a project, you start reviewing code and you grow in kind of like a repository or a, a group where you learn and grow and have fun together. So to recap, code reviews, you practice debating. You practice going in depth with the language and understanding what it does. You practice presenting yourself well. And you practice healthy arguing. So my friend Robbie said that these things don't really work well with questions in this format. So if you have any questions or you want to talk to me later, talk to me at the breaks, talk to me at the after party, or talk to me at Twitter. Thank you so much for being a great audience. I'll talk to you later. Yeah. Some of the big